It is my great pleasure to announce uh, our keynote speaker today, Jamie Nelson Nunez. She's an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of New Mexico. Uh, she, uh, her research has focused on the politics uh, of water across the Americas and especially around uh, the politics of drinking water. Uh, she has also focused on the interactions among the different levels of local governments and the NGOs and how they play a role to shape the politics around uh, the, di the distribution and the access uh, of water uh, for the communities. And uh, most importantly, she has been working in the interdis in interdisciplinary teams uh, to try and understand the politics around water for over a decade. Uh, so I welcome you, Jamie. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And I'm sure we have a fruitful discussion after your talk. Good morning. Shorter. Is that okay? Yeah? Great. Well, good morning. You all look bright and awake. I'm sure you got a lot of sleep last night. It's been a wonderful week so far, and I just want to start by, by sort of um, thanking um, everybody. It's, uh, I've met a lot of friends, a lot of inspiring people. I've learned a lot of things in the last two days. I'm really appreciative that we have yet one more day ahead of us. Um, to participate in a network like this is so important to build connections, um, and to build a community. If we're going to confront the challenges of climate change, and we deal on a daily basis in our work, um, sort of looking at really difficult realities and very pessimistic futures, it's very important that we invest also in building a sense of community for our own mental health, but also for the quality of our research and the capacity of the solutions that we might be able to not only generate ideas about, but also get implemented. So I feel like a, a conference like this is so critical for us to come together and start to build these connections. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Cuenca and Dea Day um, and the SDG Nexus Network. Um, and a special thanks to Bjorn Wesser and um, Rolando Sayeri and Mario Cureva for making it possible for me to be here. I also want to recognize all of these amazing people, mainly students and other people associated with the University of Cuenca that are just behind the scenes making everything be so seamless. It's just been such a delight to be here. So thank you. Um, let's see here. Oh, I don't have the clicker. That will make things hard. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna to present today on, the, on confronting the politics of water security. And we've been introduced to this, um, this image so far um, in thinking about what water security is. Um, at a conference like this, a political scientist is often an oddball. I've been working for 10 years, attending different water-related conferences and the social science contingent. Can I see hands? How many of you? Okay. So we're, we're few, and political science is also kind of a sliver of that. Um, and so I, I'm taking an opportunity today to talk a little bit about what kind of ideas I might be able to bring forward to match some of the conversations that we've talked about. Um, this water security conference started with the rector introducing this idea about water security, and she referred to it as fundamentally political. Right? And if we see this, this image of what is water security, it is surrounded by things that are fundamentally political. And so politics often becomes the, the, the elephant in the room at conferences like this. Um, my work in particular has been in this top corner, the drinking water and well-being category. I've worked on how rural communities get access and maintain water systems. Um, mainly in Latin America. And so um, 
it often also is something that's sort of detached from this bigger picture of all these other elements. And as I've worked with interdisciplinary groups, um, I've had the opportunity to start to expand. So what I did to, to write this talk is not focused on any particular element of my research, but to think about how it is that everything I've experienced, what I've learned from communities, what I've learned from colleagues, and what I've learned from my discipline, might help us to have some more conversation about politics in a more sort of strategic way and not just the elephant in the room. So um, I challenge you to think about your own research, your own experiences and how they relate to some of the things I'm gonna be sharing today. So this is kind of where I started in my dissertation, this kind of variation around the world with people without access to improved um, water sources. This is Another perspective, the number of people living without access to safely managed sanitation. Okay, I'd like to argue that this is a political map. Um, these are inequitable realities that you see. They are not natural geographies. And so, excuse me. So I'm going to introduce some ideas around the study of politics here. And to start a little bit, you know, when I'm, when I'm at my university and people ask me what is political science, I often forget that we need to start there. That the study of politics is a study of resources. It's the study of power. It's the study of how, how things get distributed and to whom. So who gets what and how and why. And so it's obviously um, a good fit for thinking about water since the story of water, the history of water is political. It's a central resource to our livelihoods. It's a central resource to our governments, to our states, to our communities, political systems, et cetera. And the future that we see in terms of these inequities around water is really um, quite inequitable. Um, so when we think about um, a conference like this, we have a unique opportunity to sort of avoid some of the worst outcomes of this inequality ahead of us. In order to do that, we need to have a complex sort of um, interdisciplinary group that's offering lots of different perspectives. Um, when I wrote the abstract, I was sort of thinking about the ways that political science might address these myths around water security from a political science view. But I think myths is actually maybe not the right word because it, can, it connotes something sort of negative. But really what I want us to think about is, is how the way that we think about water security, our perspectives, is playing out in our conversations, is playing out in the ways that we're designing our research projects, and is playing out actually in the ways that policies do or do not get implemented. And so I'd like to make an argument today that, um, that how our, our disciplinary um, biases and perspectives um, how they come together can really undermine our success in water security. So I'm gonna start by sort of highlighting some views and perspectives and talking about kind of the outcomes of, of why certain perspectives um, might limit our success. And I'm gonna start with a very obvious one. This is not one that is a new piece of information when you think about water access in, in rural areas and drinking water in the wash sector, I guess I should say. Um, and that is that water security is an engineering problem. I think for decades, organizations, meaning governments, non-governmental organizations, churches, even communities have really talked about access to water as being an infrastructural deficit. Um, this is a photo from my research outside of, um, of Iquitos in Peru. Um, this is a water system that was built by a religious organization. It's one of probably 60. Um, that were built in that area, and I did not encounter a single one that was functioning, and it had been built within the last two years. Um, so the problem with the engineering perspective is that we focus on building things, and yet most of the problems within, uh, within, uh, within running these systems are actually very political. So in my work, I've seen communities fail to be able to gather enough money because people don't trust the treasurer. There aren't great governance rules in place. Um, I think arguably this is a case of an organization not um, creating an equitable institution, an equitable project that included local communities to try and decide what it is that they need and how to keep things running. Um, so our failures are not bad design. Our failures are not engineering failures. 
our failures are governance failures. And in drinking water, in the wash sector, you know, the, the momentum to really change the narrative from infrastructure to service provision has, has finally, I think, really taken, turned the corner. And that's the predominant message. But I think it's also a message that we need to consider when we're thinking about all these other elements of water security, of how it's not a one-time thing. We can't come in with the technology and let the technology do the talking and leave that it's a constant service that we need to be thinking about in terms of, of um, the ways that we're coming up with solutions for climate change in communities. And I don't want to critique engineering, so hands up for the engineers. All right, yeah. my favorite people to work with, really, saved me my dissertation. Really, you know, it's a, uh, it can be a kind of a wet blanket to work with a lot of political scientists. So it's nice, it's nice to be working with you. And I feel like um, engineering has such an important role to play we need to also make space for the time to build relationships, to encourage participation, and to think about how we sustain the ideas and the understandings over time. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about this perspective, which I think is, is um, it's pervasive, not just within our own community, but sort of in the world, broadly speaking. When we think about water security, so many people are thinking about it as a climate change problem. This is a picture of Lake Popo. Um, and I'm referencing Tom Perot's work. He's a geographer. Um, and I, he participated in a workshop a few years ago at the University of New Mexico, and we had this incredible conversation um, talking about climate change as a red herring that's kind of a, it's a term in English to think about how sometimes we can refer to something so that no one pays attention to the other thing that's happening. And so when we think about the role of, of climate change and water security, we have to be really careful to make sure that it doesn't become the thing that gets all the attention. And Tom Pro's work on Lake Popo found that, that as the lake dried some years ago, the government, Evo Morales' government, and all the local governments, like so many people were talking about it being a climate change problem. When in fact, what had also happened, also happened, was the fact that the government and communities had not governed the resource well. They had overwithdrawn, there was too much water going to agriculture, and especially mining projects. And so there was this whole other layer of a narrative that was happening. And there's power in our narratives. There's, I'm trying to make a case, there's power in our ideas and our perspectives and our biases. Um, and so the power of the narrative really placed the responsibility for what had happened at the lake, mainly with industrialized countries that have been the main drivers of climate change, which yes, industrialized countries and all the people who have contributed to this problem are absolutely to blame. But if we, we think of it from this approach, we really also miss these opportunities to think about how policies um, really need to address the fact that climate change is only exacerbating um, our vulnerabilities that we've created, right, in terms of other governance issues. So um, I, I want to challenge us, I guess, not to say that it's not climate change, and this is kind of a dicey thing, but to say it's climate change and. And I think Peggy Stern said something about that in the conference on the first day. So the nice thing about a keynote speech on the last day is that you get to sort of summarize and pick these little pieces of information up from, from the previous days. So I hope to interweave those. Okay. I'm also going to say this perspective that water security is an information problem also is a bit problematic, right? We've had a lot of discussions in the last two days about needing more data. And I think it was Alex Fremier who said, of course, the scientists are going to say we want more data. Um, but I think we have to think carefully about information and data and what it provides. On one hand, data really matters with respect to water security. Our laws, our, um, our policies, our, our organizations and institutions, they're all based on, an, um, on rules that, are, that were built in the past around notions about water availability that no longer exist. We need data to update those and to also give us some sense of what's to come. Even if the data is telling us that the margin of error around those estimates is just incredible and very difficult for us to know. But on the other hand, data is not a solution. Um, in political science and social science more broadly, information is not what causes behavior change. And a great example, if anybody's read the book by Esther Duflo and Abdeet Banerjee on poor economics, they sort of talk about the ways that 
many people working in development expect that information is going to encourage people to make healthier choices, to make more wise investments with their time and their resources, et cetera. But we all know that more information about eating more healthily, sleeping more, exercising more is not the thing that makes you actually go out and do those things, right? So in, in behavior change, information is never enough. Um, it requires structure, it requires policies, it requires a lot of things to get us to sort of make better choices consistently. That is also true at the policy level. Information has never been enough to change policy. Um, I just had a conversation with Martin on the way in today to talk about that, that the information that we're generating is not going to be that compelling piece of information that changes our laws. In fact, there's a huge process of pushing and using the information. So we have to think about the ways that information needs to be served up in compelling ways that help people mobilize for change. Okay. I'd like to pause it that water security, this is my own view, my own bias that I'm bringing to the table, that water security is an institutional problem. And given that we are all working in these interdisciplinary circles, um, often we talk past each other with definitions. And so I just want to say that the way that I'm, I'm talking about institutions is yes, those organizations you might be thinking of in your mind about governments, about constitutions, about water policies, but institutions more broadly can also be things like informal norms and shared understandings. Basically an institution is a way that we can predict other people's behavior and that it's a sort of a way of, of um, constraining our own choices and our own behavior. And so what I see is that we have an institutional problem with respect to, to water security. So I'm going to spend a few slides here sort of talking about um, my insights that kind of revolve around these ideas of the institutional roots of water security. And I'm trying to highlight a few pieces to make them and serve them up so that they hopefully will speak to, to some aspects of your work. So it's a challenge to you to sort of think about um, some of my ideas and how they might be playing out in very different disciplines and different elements of water security in different parts of the world. Okay. Um, my first insight, it sort of, you know, looking across all the years that I've been working in water security, is that we really cannot place responsibility for water security on communities. Um, this is it happens both by rule, when people sort of think about um, community-managed water resources, um, but it also happens just de facto when we don't really have a better plan in place. We haven't made an effort um, to remove the responsibility um, from the shoulders of the most vulnerable populations. And so um, when we think about who's in charge of drinking water, for example, and managing their water systems, it makes a lot of sense from a, a sort of institutional design that you would want those decisions to be, you would want all of that to be happening at the local level. But the reality is that in many places, especially rural areas of the world, people are confronting multiple overlapping vulnerabilities. And so one of the things I like to do with my students is I ask them, and this is more relevant for a US sort of group, but I ask them, what, how many of you made a decision to drink water today? Or how many of you made a decision about how to treat your water? Um, or how much to haul, or how much to save, right? How many of you made a decision that your water was safe enough to actually drink, et cetera? And of course, my students are all looking at me like I'm asking the most ridiculous thing. But we have to think about the ways in which we're asking rural communities to be in charge of not just drinking water, but so many different elements of management and governance. And they're doing so many other things with their lives. One of the greatest sort of achievements is that we've created institutions in other parts of the world that remove that responsibility from our shoulders so that we can focus on other things. And so I want us to be attentive in a sense, I'm trying to draw a balance here, that on one hand, we really want to center our work so that it starts at the grassroots. We have really, we have solutions that work at very local levels um, and that are empowering to local, communities, but on the other hand, it has to be very careful that we're not also putting all of the responsibility on people who have an incredible burden for many other aspects of their lives. Uh, this one is, I think, 
sort of more obvious. Well, I'm going to actually start with a, just a brief description of what you see in this photo. So this is a rural community also outside of Iquitos, Peru. And on the right, you see a water system. There's no longer any tank on it, but it was built by Rotary International, an NGO. Um, and it was serving the community, and the community was really happy about it. Um, on the left, um, I think that's, I can't, I can't say it in meters, in yards, um, um, probably about 15 yards away, is a new government system. Um, and, you know, they are overlapping. So, you know, about a year later, Rotary went back and tried to dismantle their water system and try and see if they could repurpose it for another community. But what we have within water security are these real political issues at local levels. And I think part of it mean, is, is reflective of the fact that we're not considering um, political incentives that different organizations have. We're sort of expecting that everybody's operating from the priority of just building water systems and helping people. But often politicians and NGOs, they have incentives to prioritize new infrastructure. Um, because it's shiny and new, because you can take a photo with the community, you can get votes, or you can get more donors. Um, it's easy to count. Service provision is a lot harder for us to quantify. It's the hard work that we need to be doing. But in general, the reason I, I sort of show this is because the, these political incentives kind of disrupt all kinds of policies that are coming down, even financial flows across the world that are there to sort of support um, water security in rural communities, and they're falling sort of into these cracks of these political incentives. So whatever it is that we're trying to do, we need to really consider what are the roles of local government, and how is it that we align their incentives to match the kinds of policies, the kinds of ideas and programs that we are, are hoping to support and generate. Okay. Um, the third point I'd like to make is to that we, need, we really have to start insisting on equity. I mean, the entire issue of water security is um, inequality. And so I'm drawing this perspective from my work on a project in Honduras in the dry corridor, where a number of rural communities are living in, in areas where they're able to, they've, they've been successful in building water systems. But what's happening is that people that are living closer to the water system have as much water as they need, and the people that live far away no longer get the water in their tap. Um, also, during the dry season, they don't really know how much water they need to be using. For them to have some sort of technology like a water meter um, is a huge investment. It means they, buy, they don't get to buy other things with their money. They have to buy this water meter and keep it running. There are all kinds of problems around this, but water meters are a measure of adapt, you know, of resilience or adaptation to adaptation, excuse me, to climate change. And so what we found in our work on this project is looking at attitudes towards metering and other adaptation um, approaches to water insecurity in the dry corridor. And what we found is it wasn't actually the, the outcome that mattered. To take to install meters, to not install meters, to take other forms of decisions in the community. Sorry, sorry how do I say this? That it wasn't about the meters. It wasn't about the actual policy or outcome. It was about how decisions were made that engendered the most amount of support. So for example, in our, in our survey work, ran some experimental um, approaches. What we found is that people who supported meters felt like an outcome was more equitable and even sustainable, um, regardless if they implemented meters or not, as long as communities were actually making the decisions in a democratic way. So we ran a survey experiment that sort of prompted people to think about different ways that decisions get made. And it shows that we think about these, these policies that are going to work and hopefully reach a lot of different communities. But we need to think about the ways that they're empowered to make the decisions to take on our ideas. Um, and in political science, there's a nice way of thinking about um, equity in institutions, three forms of equity. And I hope this is something we can all put in our pockets. Um, there's representational equity that all groups that are, have a vested interest in the issue actually have a seat at the table. They're included. They come to our conferences. <laughs> they get to be part of the policy dialogue. Procedural equity is yet something more important, or I guess is sort of the next step, is to make sure that groups also have the capacity to fairly engage in the process and influence the outputs. It is not enough to include people 
it, they have to also have agency in being able to choose the outcomes and weigh in on the outcomes. And finally, the last idea of equity is distributional equity, which is the fair distribution of outcomes, that we have to look at what comes out of these processes and whether or not there's equity in the outcomes, both good and bad, that arise from the process. So. And I feel like I've heard this also in the last couple of days. Um, so I, as Mario mentioned, I, I, I've started thinking about water security from a community perspective, and then I started to notice the role and the influence of local governments and NGOs. But then in talking to mayors and to NGOs, they're also operating in this big network of um, a large institutional structure of sort of the national government and multi-level governance, how they relate to regional governments, how they relate to the national government. And so I've, I've done a, a fair bit of work in Peru and also looking at the policies in Honduras about how do we change the water sector? How do we make really big change at central levels and see it trickle down to, to even very remote communities? And I think this was a comment that was made yesterday is like what the, the policies are in place, the laws have been passed. How come we're not seeing change? And I think it's because we are a bit myopically focused on establishing the policies, coming up with our good ideas, and we are spending far less energy in thinking about the implementation of the policies and also the iteration in policies. Are they working? How do they need to change? Do we have mechanisms that are built into the implementation of getting feedback and making modification to our, to our policies? Something that's exceedingly important, especially if um, you know, water security scenarios are constantly changing. Um, I'd like to argue, right, that change just doesn't happen from this new policies. It comes from ensuring these implementations and how they're monitored. And some examples, Honduras, for example, they, they established a brand new water framework law, and it's been 20 years. They came up with all kinds of pretty impressive ideas about the ways to encourage um, institutional development at very remote rural areas to support rural communities. One of those is to get legal identity so that you could have bank accounts so that you could save money to buy things for water systems. It's been 20 years and the majority of rural communities do not have that legal identity still. So these rollouts of these big policies are not, they're not changing things because we're not paying attention to the ways in which politics are interrupting it at various levels within government. So as you, generate policies and ideas, we have to really think about how they're gonna get translated across, across large contexts, large political contexts. Um, and some more recent work I've been doing, looking at the politics of desalinization, it's becoming very clear that the time is now that we really need to be pushing to incorporate the future into our water policies and our, and our institutions that regulate water resources. Um, it's a known adage in political science that frontier resources, when institutions are too slow to sort of think about frontier resources, the rules that get established to regulate those frontier resources are established by the people that are first to get there. Um, in the case, for example, of Chile, the first people to get there are the mining corporations. They're building lots of desalinization plants. Desalinization in Chile is a very, like there's a, it's an interesting, optimistic um, narrative that people are talking about in Chile about the possibility of sort of solving all of their water security issues by, maybe not all of them, but many of them, by being able to tap the ocean. Um, but we have to really think about equity in these institutions because they're not built yet. And some other examples of that would be wastewater use, reuse. We don't have... Um, uh, water property institutions that really sort of help us understand whose water is it when you reuse it or whose water is it if you're generating it from atmospheric um, rain harvest or har rain, excuse me, atmospheric harvesting. And I think we also have this big gap about thinking about cloud seeding. Like there's a lot of ways in which our institutions regulating policy or water are still operating on narratives of how we manage rivers from 100 years ago. So these are the moments for us to be thinking ahead. And, and I found it really interesting, this line of budgeting for failure. Like how do we create our policies so that we have a large margin of error that we could be working with a lot less water in the future than what we're even thinking about now? Um, two more points. We need social movements. Um, we need social movements in order to make institutional change profound institutional change. 
I think a lot of times scientists have a narrative that we just kind of have a technocratic process. And it is true that in many countries, a technocratic process has evolved in government, that we hire experts and experts do good work, they write good policies, politicians listen, they get them implemented. But the reality is that in many places, that is not happening. And the way that we get to change is to get a lot of people on board, to change those political incentives, to get people to listen to the good data that we're providing them. So part of this missing, the kind of black box between using our data, using our knowledge, um, and, and, and getting some sort of policy outcome has to do with finding ways to mobilize people. I mean, I'm kind of curious how many of you have participated in a march or some sort of political act for climate change in the last year. It, it's, it's, a, it's actually collective action, both at local levels and also at global levels, is a very difficult thing to create. And so I want to give us some ideas just to kind of keep in mind as you start to generate that information and your ideas about how your work might best fit into motivating social movements, motivating collective action. And one of those is to really consider the roles of emotion in the way that we talk about our data. I'm not a communication specialist or a marketer, but I do know from studying social movements that social movements, by the way, are, they're, they're mostly um, unsuccessful. The very few social movements are very successful. And the qualities that we see in successful social movements have to do with this combination of fear and hope. And I think often we might be talking in the realm of fear and hoping that fear is enough to motivate people to do something. In fact, we also need to be providing hope that we have a fear of an injustice or a threat in the future is matched with a policy or something that we can do about it. And so we have to be really careful with the data and the information that we're supplying, that we're, we're not just saying we're in trouble, we have specific ideas that can motivate people. Um, to, to take action, to feel like turning out to a protest or voting, et cetera, matters. The other piece I'll, I'll, I'll highlight from um, political science research is this notion of efficacy. Political efficacy is the idea that, that you think that what you do could actually change outcomes. And political efficacy as a personal property can go up and down in your life. And there's this really interesting work that looks at efficacy um, amongst individuals who have never been engaged in politics versus um, individuals their first time engaged in politics, their first campaign, for example. And the people who, have, who are just starting, they have more efficacy than people who don't do anything at that moment. But then if they're part of a campaign that wins, their efficacy goes way up. If they're part of a campaign that loses, their efficacy goes actually to lower average levels than people who were never politically engaged to begin with. So one of the things about sustaining a social movement is to build in ways that we have, we have goals that are achievable in the short term. We have to think about the moments of you've got a, a group of people protesting and whether or not they win on a big issue. The next thing has to also be something that they can win as well. We have to kind of stage our goals and our progress so that we keep people feeling like they can do something about this. Okay, this last one I'm sort of throwing in as a result of the conversations that we've had in the last couple of days about the importance of transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. Um, for those of you who have not really been introduced to the idea of transdisciplinary research, um, interdisciplinary is across disciplines. Transdisciplinary is supposed to get out of the sort of research realm, the academic research realm. I know there are multiple definitions here, but the one that I sort of most understand and can communicate best is that we generate our, our research questions, we generate our research methodologies, et cetera, including communities, people outside of the space of academia or research groups. And transdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary research is hard. Transdisciplinary research is really hard. There are formidable barriers, for example, in academia, if you're a junior professor, if you're a graduate student, you have, you, you, you have long time horizons that are necessary for transdisciplinary research to really build collaborative groups like that. 
Um, and so there are going to be a lot of people who can't do that alone. We need large institutions, collaborative networks like this, in order to actually seed transdisciplinary research and to make it happen. Um, and interdisciplinary research also doesn't happen by just putting people in rooms together. I'd like to make a call to think about the ways in which you're sort of, under what conditions are you forced to change your approaches? Are you forced to think about other disciplinary perspectives? It doesn't happen just by talking about it. We have to think about how we design our conferences, how we design our research teams so that there is sort of equity again, but also like mechanisms to make sure that everybody's having to work together. Um, this work is really hard. It is absolutely essential. I think that's not something I need to convince anybody in this room about. Um, but what I do want to convince people about is that we have to think about more intentionally ways to be successful in interdisciplinary research. And then the other thing is to think about like who are we inviting to the table? Um, political science can weigh in with politics, yes. Um, but it would be so great to have maybe even a psychologist to talk about more about the psychology of change and how people react or communication specialists somebody had mentioned. Um, and absolutely, we need to have policymakers. We need to also think about student organizations, social movements, key leaders that would be invited into spaces and not just to listen, but also to contribute. So it's a call to think, rethink some of the ways that we interact to be more inclusive so that we can get um, a broader impact. So I'm going to sort of maybe end here, wrap up here, um, and maybe challenge uh, you all to think about, I'd love to hear, I mean, I guess a keynote speak, speech, usually I take your questions, but I would also love to hear your perspectives on what elements of these points maybe most speak to you. So thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Jamie. That was great. Now we have uh, 10 minutes to take your questions, your contributions, your comments. Uh, is someone helping with the microphone? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for a wonderful presentation. Ah, here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question is, um, what recommendations can you give us when we have to work with institutions, as you mentioned? Um, sometimes that's where the problem uh, is and what we need to address. But what when uh, the institution you're working with, like, for example, for us in, the, in a project we had, we, we have to deal things with an institution, but we're also part of an institution. And the very first thing we did in our project was that, okay, we need to come with this message of like trying to save water and stuff. And we saw that inside our institution, we needed to change things. Mm -hmm. And it was quite funny because we said, okay, we need to do things first inside in order to go from here to the rest of the uh, population. So what recommendations can you give us whenever we, we feel like those, needs, need, those changes need to be done uh, inside and outside? Yeah. I hope to give you recommendations, but I'm going to start with a little bit easier sort of ideas about institutions. What we know about institutions, they are built to protect the status quo. That's why we have them, so that we can predict our behavior, we can constrain our decisions, et cetera. So it, they're very hard to change. And one of the reasons that they're very hard to change is because they're also sort of in an ecosystem of institutions. They're overlapping, they're layering. And so you can sort of think about one institution, but it's it's connected to so many others. And so sometimes trying to promote change in one doesn't happen until we also include ideas about changing another. Um, ideas, I mean, in, in some ways, the question is also broad. And so it's hard to give really specific advice. Um, I think it's important to, to really listen and ask the question, why? Why are we doing this? Why are you doing this? What's the benefit of this? And, and to sort of spend some more time, sometimes we have to back up in our projects and our efforts, our programs, 
and start with the, the, the research to understand and ask more questions before we can engender that change. And sometimes I think that is just an opportunity to realize that th that preliminary groundwork of understanding why things are the way they are just needs to be more developed before you could make more progress. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about uh, uh, um, something you mentioned uh, related to the important uh, the important importance of collective action, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and this general uh, idea of collective coll uh, collective action. I, I would like it. I, I would like to relate it to the to the situation to a situ situation uh, that is. Uh, very important right now in Latin America. I don't know if you know that uh, recently uh, in Argentina, uh, 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 Javier Milei was elected president. Uh, I mean, uh, his ideas are, uh, let's say, the, the complete opposite of collective action. Uh, he actually, in the limit, his he would like to have like uh, a bunch of individuals with their properties who sign contracts, and that's the only way to have uh, collective collective action according to to his political philosophy, his uh, libertarian political philosophy. He even has said that uh, uh, collecting taxes is uh, is theft. So uh, I think we have a, a, a new re reality, and I, I think it's not like something. Uh, uh, it's not like something that uh, is, is is just, let's say, let's say uh, uh, a, a, a very a, a very strange thing that happened in Argentina. It's it's something that is happening, and especially in Latin America, there is the Madrid Forum. I mean, with people in all uh, uh, countries in uh, Latin America and in Spain. So all, all these things that you have talked about, I think that come from a framework in which you have communities, you have a state. Even if you can criticize a lot of the things they do, uh, uh, you, you have mentioned the, their importance to uh, for for wa water security, mm -hmm. with this new, with this let's say new because they are not new, but uh, the, the, the new thing is, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 new thing is that uh, they are winning elections. Uh, what 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 do, what do you think about that? I mean, how how uh, we should change our mindset and our collective action? in order to take into account uh, this, uh, this reality, this political reality? I'm so glad you asked me an easy question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the movement, the sort of populist movement, by definition, is anti-institutional. It gets breath, it gets energy, because people are tired of the institutions and they don't know how to change them. And so the message that they're gonna to be torn down is liberating. And the message is superficial. The policy is behind it and what really happens in terms of the equity and, and, and um, sort of building capacity and all that, that is a very separate thing. Like how government's really going to work is fully divorced from the notion of let's, let's do something new and different. I mean, I'm not saying anything that you don't already know if you live in Argentina. Um, it's, that's the narrative that's capturing the sort of angry vote, right? Um, the vote against the system is really what we're seeing. And there are people that are quite adept at figuring out how to capture that. Through, and, and I think also the negative messaging, um, the fear, fear does inspire you to vote. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's potent. Um, is there some solution that I can talk about with this? I mean, I think we need to act 
very quickly to sort of shore up moderating effects that we can do to sort of think about really big institutional change without having to go to the extremes of waiting for a moment where the system feels so broken that people are willing to just smash it all together. Um, if there was another response, I was gonna sort of talk about this um, sort of with respect to water security. I'll see if I can remember it, but I'm not sure that that's a very satisfying answer, but I also, you gave me a, you didn't give me a softball there. Um, <laughs> Uh, we are, oh, I know, I know what I was going to say. Like part, of, I, I started this talk when I, when I started writing, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this transition from the SD, the MDGs to the SDGs. And one of the things I really worry about, bear with me, this is a tangent. Um, I worry about thinking about water security as a gap. And so the MDGs were this pretty innovative approach to bring a lot of people together to focus on very specific goals. The SDGs were arguably the biggest exercise in, in human, like global governance, in human governance ever, in the history of humankind. We had so many people at the table, and we got so many goals. <laughs> um, we did better. They were more inclusive, right? Everybody's on the hook for the SDGs. Um, they were more sort of detailed. They didn't overlook things, and they're more universal. So the drinking water goal is universal access to equitable and safe water. The way it gets talked about is like this gap, where we're at, where we need to be, are we on track to meet our goals? And one of the things I'm a little worried about is that we're focused on the gap, but I'm worried about the progress we've already made. It was made on a different reality. It was made on a global... Um, uh, trade scenario that was running, it was, it was highly efficient before the pandemic. Um, and then we started to see the implementation of new tariffs, problems in the global supply chain, inflation, pandemics, wars, other things that make it a lot harder to just get goods. It was also built at a time, the MDGs and this idea that all of this, this progress is also taking place in a context where democracy was holding steady, I would say. It was not growing at the time. But now democracy is in decline. Strong democracies are backsliding. Weak democracies and even strong democracies are, are falling. And I think democracy is an important element for us to think about water security because of its sort of built-in mechanisms that at least aspire to be inclusive and encourage participation. Um, and so I think, I think it's an important point, what you're saying about the connection between an election last week um, and the outcomes of water security tomorrow. It is absolutely true. There is an important political dimension there. So um, I think we have to really take into consideration that the scenarios that got us this far are all changing. Our underlying assumptions about what we need to do for progress might be built on things that are sort of changing. And I think the results of that election sort of bring this, bring this really into the present to see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, as an institutional economist, I couldn't agree more uh, with what you said. Um, thanks a lot. I'm thank here, you. Martin. <laughs> um, and thanks for, for um, yeah, presenting your takeaway messages so beautifully colorful, as we see here, uh, and I think also well formulated to actually remember them. That was quite helpful, I think. Um, I would like to uh, raise a question on one of your messages, and that's maybe a question to you. How could we modify our institutional incentives in academia to promote more mm. transdisciplinary research? Mm -hmm. And I have a proposal also, or, or yeah, a, ch a little challenge actually, to the numbers that you gave in the very beginning on your maps, which I found also stimulating, but I think um, they would be even more... Uh, um, Meaningful if you if you showed the 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 share of people uh, in the overall population that don't have access to water or that that suffer from certain uh, weaknesses. It showed to, it seemed to me the the map was just reflecting the number of people living in the country, not not necessarily how severe the water problems are. Yeah, absolutely. The maps. I, I spent a lot of time trying to create inequality maps, and and the JMP has done an incredible job of getting information out really 
to be able to even measure and get outcomes with the MDGs on water data. It's also deeply flawed. Um, but one of the cool things that they've done is to start to release data on equity. Um, so I spent a lot of time trying to see if I could find maps about equity around the world, because that was the message I really wanted to, to, to show. Like, um, it's unfortunate, you know, these maps are, they're, they're, they're aggregated to the national level. Um, so we don't really see, we don't see what's going on within countries. It's another reason why I think that thinking about gap approaches to reaching a goal are a little problematic because we're sort of not realizing um, the inequities that are happening with the United States. For example, in my own state, there are a lot of people that are living without access to clean drinking water. Um, that doesn't show up because the United States shows us having achieved that goal. Um, so yes, the maps are flawed. They were mainly for me to sort of make a point that, um, that, that water security is political. These are political maps. They're not just, um, anyway. Your point um, about academia and to think about that is also an illustration of how our institutions are overlapping. So one thing that happens in the United States is you get higher up levels to hire as a cluster or to try and seed research groups that are working together. And I'll just illustrate this, you know, from a political science standpoint. I, I feel like I do political science work, but I also do, you know, other work on, on water policy. And they can be very different worlds with very different collaborators and very different papers that get published in very different journals. But the institutions themselves have their own incentives. So political science wants to see that I'm publishing in the top political science journals. And they may not be very interested in things that are problem-oriented as opposed to theoretically oriented. I may not be able to land a piece on water politics in those sorts of fora. So um, again, it's a call for us to think that it's not one policy. I mean, we can have a very disruptive policy that makes a lot of change because it, it sort of forces everybody to reshuffle. But we have to sort of understand that there, we can't just say, let's get people together on a research project, I'll give money to that project. Um, or I'm gonna hire a bunch of people that study the same thing and hope that they work together. We have to also think about all those other layers that are sort of evolving so that we maintain those disciplinary boundaries. Um, I think it's hard work. Um, I think it's really hard work to be able to present your stuff in a way that people who have never studied your discipline can understand. Um, and that is a, a huge challenge for science in general. I mean, there's a whole field to communicating science. Um, but there are communication barriers, but I also would argue that the bigger piece are those institutional barriers that we need to think about in higher ed. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for the raising hands that were unanswered. Uh, I'm sure we have time during the day to ask your questions. We thank Jamie again for the keynote, and thank you for your questions and comments.